Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks, Dwight, for your presentation. We're going to uh, continue in this study on uh, the crisis ahead, which is a compilation put together by Robert Olson um, back a long time ago. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit's presence here as we study together. Help us to keep in mind the things that you have been teaching us with the light that has been shining up upon our hearts into the darkness. And um, we ask, Lord, that we can come to that light, that we can see our sins that we can confess them and forsake them, and that we can receive of the righteousness of Christ in our lives. We know, Lord, that as we look at prophecy and the warnings in the spirit of prophecy regarding the things that are coming upon the world, we ask, Lord, that these things, we can understand them and that they can help us in ministering and sharing the truth to others. We pr pray for your angels' care and protection for your Holy Spirit to continue to speak to us. Thank you for the Sabbath and the time we have together. And we pray and ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, we're on uh, part two in the crisis ahead. And um, this section here is going to deal with the union of the churches. So back in the 1990s, this was a major focus among Seventh-day Adventists, even in the 80s looking at what was happening with the, the Protestants and the Catholics. Um, so I know some pastors who were, or one pastor in particular who was collecting everything he could, you know, from the news and so forth and putting it together in, in like, a, I guess it would be like a scrapbook of all these different things that uh, were happening. And uh, it's not as much a focus now. I don't hear much about it now. But it was definitely something we talked about back in the 80s and 90s. So, um, again, uh, Olson has put these, uh, this study in a question and answer form. So he asks a question and then a statement from the spirit of prophecy. So the question here under the union of the churches, will every Protestant denomination in America enter into the coming union of the churches? Uh, from Great Controversy 445, when the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result so here we can see, when does this union happen? What What is this union about? This is the best we can do. Uh, that's, that's probably too zoomed in, right, Iran? It's probably okay. Okay. It's just easier for people to read. So when we're looking at this union, what kind of union is this? It's and um, a shared belief. Okay, so they, so they unite up on points of doctrine, right? So there, there is, we would call this ecumenism, the ecumenical movement, right? So that there is this looking for things that are in common, right? And, and we saw that in the study last night dealing with the Adventists and the Evangelicals. The Evangelicals have been trying to unite, well, the Adventists are trying to unite too with Evangelicals. But there's this this idea that somehow we need to be united with people and we find whatever we can find in common to unite us. Okay. So it, it always has the sense of sounding good. Now they're going to um, unite and they're going to influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions. So, so the purpose of this union is what? How would we to to sustain their purposes? OK, well, it's it's so that they can have an influence with the state. Right. Mm -hmm. So the reason why they're uniting is not so that they can be, you know, more effective in giving the gospel. Right. 
but it's so that they can be more effective in influencing the state. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So when the church loses the power of the gospel, it seeks the power of the state. And, and when, when churches set aside their beliefs to find things that they hold in common, they're setting aside the gospel. And because they have set aside the gospel, they have to seek the power of the state to do the work to sustain their institutions. Assuming they had the gospel, right? Well, yeah, but but that's that's what I'm saying is they have abandoned the gospel in order to do this. Okay, um, so on what basis will the Protestant churches eventually unite? Uh, Great Controversy 444. The wide diversity of belief in the Protestant churches is regarded by many as a decisive proof that no effort to secure a forced uniformity can ever be made. But there has been for years in churches of the Protestant faith a strong and growing sentiment in favor of a union based upon common points of doctrine. To secure such a union, the discussion of subjects upon which all were not agreed, however important they might be, from a Bible standpoint, standpoint, must necessarily be waived, right? So we have seen this happening. I mean, Ellen White's writing about this in the 1880s. We know that this this definitely has been ramped up much larger. Like right now, talking about a union, the the diversity within the Protestant world, there's really much more a union than any kind of diversity. There's not many Protestant churches that um, have not been united in some way, correct? That's right. Yeah. yeah, this diversity that used to exist doesn't really exist much anymore. Uh, even It's even changed since the 1970s when, you know, I remember hearing about this. Um, people can easily go from one denomination to another. And there's not really a problem. Okay, what are the two principal erroneous doctrines held in common by the churches? Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. So we can see one of the the things that really has united the churches is... uh, um, spiritualism, which is really an underlying a belief that exists. It manifests itself in various different ways within Christendom. And of course, the keeping of the Sunday, right? That, that those things exist. Those things are not set aside. And if we talk about um, spiritualism, we can look at things like spiritual formation. So even though Adventists don't believe in the immortality of the soul, they have bought into systems and ideas that are based upon these more spiritualistic ideas. Uh, will Protestantism eventually reunite with Catholicism? So there's going to be three statements here. And the first one says, the word of God teaches that these scenes, the suppression of the Sabbath, are to be repeated as Roman Catholics and Protestants shall unite for the exaltation of the Sunday. Great Controversy 578. And from Review and Herald, uh, I think that's June 1st, 1886, how the Roman church can clear herself from the charge of idolatry, we cannot see. And this is the religion which Protestants are beginning to look upon with so much favor and which will eventually be united with Protestantism. Now, um, now she's talking about the 1880s. Anybody know what what she's referring to in the 1880s? It was uh, Blair's Blair's bill to about the World Fair. Okay, well, yeah, that that definitely is happening then. But I, I think there's something else that she's when you look at Protestantism are beginning to look upon with so much favor the Catholic Church, the Roman Church. There there had been change um, changes in regard to how people looked at Catholics. So. So I would point to well something that actually happened a bit earlier, which would be the Oxford movement. Is anybody familiar with the Oxford movement? 
No, I can't say that I am. Okay. Nobody? I've heard of uh, Bishop Newman. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of people involved. So the Oxford movement was a, well, part of it, um, and I believe Walter C. Scott had part to do with that as well. But there was sort of a, a type of romanticizing of Catholicism that began. Now, the Oxford movement is, is partially responsible. It's connected to uh, Westcott and Hort, who, um, as we know, uh, were involved in uh, basically the textual criticism that led to these new translations, so to a new Greek uh, text, right? I don't know how many people are familiar with Westcott and Hort, um, but, but this is a movement that was romanticized Catholicism, and it was really a big part after 1798 that led to um, connecting Protestants back again with Catholics. So I, I would look at it as the start of that. And that's going to start like in the 1830s. So, so I think to some degree, Ellen White is talking about that. But there is this move that has been happening in the 1800s, in the 19th century, to, to go back to Catholicism. Now, we can see that that, that bridge has been almost completely repaired, that there isn't um, this wariness regarding the Catholic Church. Now, um, you know, I was raised, you know, in, the, in as a Christian, um, into Christian music in the 1970s. There's this guy named Keith Green. He died in a plane crash, I think, in 1980 or something like that, or 81, 82. But... Um, Anyway, he, I, I used to get his last day's ministries uh, newsletter and he had lots of anti-Catholic uh, articles. After his death, um, a lot of those, uh, his views on Catholicism, whoever carried on his ministry, uh, those things became more muted. So I don't think there's many Christians today who would really be down on the Catholic Church. I mean, there are some, but most don't see the Catholic Church as dangerous. In Ellen White's day, the vast majority of Protestants were utterly opposed to the Catholic Church. The word Protestant really has, doesn't have much meaning today. Okay, um, this next statement here, as long as probation continues, there will be opportunity for can, the canvasser to work. When the religious denomination, denominations unite with the papacy to oppress, oops, sorry about that. I hit the, hit the wrong thing here. Um, to oppress God's people, places where there is religious freedom will be opened by evangelistic canvassing. Now, I'm not sure how that actually answers that question. Just that the religious denominations unite with the papacy to oppress God's people. Um, I guess that's the part of it. So that's going to be during the Sunday law, right? That's the idea there. Where there'll be organizational unity or unity of action. The professed Protestant world will form a confederacy with the man of sin and the church and the world will be in corrupt harmony. So, I mean, here we can see that uh, there's actually a threefold union here, right? The professed Protestant world the man of sin, the papacy, and the world, right? So the, the institutions aren't the same, uh, but it's an organizational unity. Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honor all the divine precepts. Great controversy 616. Will Rome change or will Protestantism change in order to make this union possible. Now, of course, uh, we know it's Rome never changes. The union will not, however, be affected by a change in Catholicism, for Rome never changes. She claims infallibility. It is Protestantism that will change. The adoption of liberal ideas on its part will bring it where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism. The Bible 
the Bible is the foundation of our faith, was the cry of Protestants in Luther's time, while the Catholics cried, the Father's custom tradition. Now, many Protestants find it difficult to prove their doctrines from the Bible, and yet they have not the moral courage to accept the truth, which involves a cross. Therefore, they are fast coming to the ground of Catholics. Yes, the Protestants of the 19th century are fast approaching the Catholics in their infidelity concerning the scriptures. So how does this um, liberalism, what is she talking about liberal ideas? What does she mean by that? She means something different than we would generally mean. What are the liberal ideas that Protestants are allowing or adopting at that time? Anybody know what these liberal ideas are? I'm thinking uh, a, a liberal attitude toward Rome. Well, like, no. Uh, no, no, no. That's dinner. not what she means. She does okay. it. Your liberal ideas. So, what is a liberal idea? What would? I mean, yeah, you're thinking of it in how we tem- tend to think of liberal today. But what would she mean by a liberal idea? All inclusive. Maybe. Sorry, Stephen. Go ahead. I was thinking that antinomianism. Okay. Um, well, in part, but that, but there's something that comes first. I mean, look at what the rest of the paragraph talks about. It has to do with the Bible. It's a, it's an approach to how we study the scriptures. So the type of, of biblical criticism where you treat the Bible as you would any other, uh, ancient document, right? Uh, higher criticism. Does that make sense? So these things are happening in Germany to a large degree, too. Are people not familiar with, with what I'm talking about? The, um, the series that uh, Wayne, Dwayne Dewey, Dewey done uh, yeah. went into that quite a bit. With mm. how it was, uh, taking place in Germany in particular. Right. So Dwayne Dewey did a series back in 2012, uh, in the spring of 2012, called The Desolations of Jerusalem. And and so I think that's what Ellen White's referring to as the liberal ideas. Right. So we often just think of liberal ideas in the way. Um, so Kelly put a definition here, uh, 1828 Webster's, no Webster's Dictionary. Right. So it'd be the definition would be number four, general, extensive embracing literature and sciences generally as a liberal education. So it's not these other things about being, you know, generous or free of heart or things like that. It would have to do uh, with this this idea of a liberal education. So a collegiate ed- education. OK. That's the way that I would take that she's using liberal, the adoption of liberal ideas, right? Because none of the others would really apply as anything dangerous. Okay, makes sense? So this this difference of how we look at the Bible, and it's going to infect uh, the study of the scriptures. Okay, the, the next statement, the Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, and when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism. When under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan, and that the end is near. Okay, we looked at these two statements before. What's the difference about these two sta- statements? Five Testimonies 451 and Great Controversy 588. What did, what did we note about these statements? Why does she write it differently? What is she writing differently and why? 
Does anybody remember? Well, in one, she says it's the uh, Protestants that reach over and clasp her hand. And then the other one, she says, is it Spiritism or something? Okay, so the first one, she says, the Protestants stretch their hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism. In the Great Controversy, she's going to mention spiritualism first. In both of these, the gulf is first, right? So, but in the one in 5T, when they stretch their hands across the gulf, they grasp the hand of the Roman power. And um, so she switches the order of Rome and spiritualism. She doesn't switch the order of gulf and abyss. Now, why why was that important? Why did we, what did we notice about this before? Well, I think we had made mention of uh, chiasm. Okay, yeah. So there's something chiastic about it. And, and there's also has to do with the context of what she's writing about. So um, in five testimonies, she's writing about, uh, uh, let me see here. I'm just, she's going she's gonna to be comparing uh, the Sunday law in the time of Esther, right? And then she says, the same masterful mind that plotted against the faithful in ages past is still seeking to rid the earth of those who fear God and obey his law. Satan will excite indignation against the humble minority who conscientiously refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. Men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God. Wealth, genius, education will combine to cover them with contempt. Persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them. With voice and pen, by boasts, threats, and ridicule, they will seek to overthrow their faith. By false representations and angry appeals, they will stir up the passions of the people. Not having a thus saith the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath, they will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack. Uh, to secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for a Sunday law. Those who fear God cannot accept an institution that violates a precept of the Decalogue. On this battlefield comes the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error. And we are not left in doubt as to the issue. Now as in the days of Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate his truth and his people. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hands of spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan. And that the end is near. So in this one, the focus is upon the Sunday law, right? That's the context in the one in 5T. And, and paralleling that with um, uh, what happened in the time of Esther. In the Great Controversy, page 588. <clears throat> This is in a chapter uh, called The Impending Conflict. And she's going to be talking about spiritualism. She's going to be talking about the doctrines of the Catholic Church. So she says uh, on page 586, I'm not going to read all of this, but I'll read some of it. The iniquity and spiritual darkness that prevailed under the supremacy of Rome were the inevitable result of her suppression of the scriptures. But where is to be found the cause of the widespread infidelity, the rejection of the law of God, and the consequent, consequent corruption under the full blaze of gospel light in the age of religious freedom? Now that Satan can no longer keep the world under his control by withholding the scripture, he resorts to other means to accomplish the same object. To destroy faith in the Bible serves his purpose 
as well as to destroy the Bible itself. By introducing the belief that God's law is not binding, he is effectually, he as effectually leads men to transgress as if they were wholly ignorant of its precepts. And now, as in former ages, he has worked through the church to further his designs. The religious organizations of the day have refused to listen to unpopular truths plainly brought to view in the scriptures. And in combating them, they have adopted interpretations and taken positions which have sown broadcast the seeds of skepticism, clinging to the papal error of the natural immortality and man's consciousness in death. They have rejected the only defense against the delusions of spiritualism. Right. So the focus here in the great controversy is uh, not as much upon on the Sunday law, but as uh, upon uh, spiritualism, the state of the dead. And, that, and that's why I think there's this difference of order, right? So she's going to mention spiritualism here first in Great Controversy. Now, now, why is that important to recognize that these two statements, which are the only two places she talks about this, I mean, it's repeated in other books, but it's the same two statements. Why is this important? Well, she mentions that there are two great errors. Okay. And and that there is two different directions that this Sunday law is coming from. Right. So so we know that is is the world consumed with spiritualism? Yes. Yes, it is. We see it all through every way, shape, and form. <laughs> the enter, the en, em, entertainment world, especially, right? I couldn't. I could hardly believe it when they had those television shows of, you know, people in an audience and a, a medium contacting their dead loved ones. A television show. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, but but you know, it's in children's programming. It's in music. It's everywhere. It's per- pervasive. Now we often think about atheism. You know, atheists, of course, don't believe in. Uh, spiritualism but atheism is another form of spiritualism so uh it, it's just it's more hidden but really most of the world oh. believes in some kind of life after death or some kind of spirits and, um, how so is how so is atheism spiritualism well because it's connected with the idea since there's no god do as thou wilt how is that spiritualism well, that's a reject. A rejection of God is spiritualism. That's just okay, right? So, but you know, it it can it can come across as you know uh, enlightenment, and you know we're not uh, you know we're not we don't believe in magic and all that kind of stuff. But it's still a branch of it, is all I'm saying. Well, so any well, rejection of God is spiritualism. Well, wouldn't you have to, in order to be? Uh... The spiritualism, wouldn't you have to believe in a God? No, that's what I'm saying is you don't. You don't need to believe in a God in order to be uh, to be a part of spiritualism. The rejection of God itself is spiritualism. That's all I'm saying. Oh, okay. Right? So atheism is a form of spiritualism. So Going after other, other entities besides God. Yeah, it's a belief in science. It's a belief in man, man's ability, you know, to evolve and become better. It, it's just, it's just, it it seems less spiritualistic than believing in, you know, Mother Earth or something like that. But really, it's no different. That's all I'm trying to say. Uh, so, I, whole, what's that? I'm reminded of, I'm reminded of Time Magazine's cover of Frederick Nietzsche, God is Dead, right? Atheism. I know there's a lot more to to that. Yeah, well, he he wasn't he wasn't really saying what they're saying. Right, they're they're misusing <laughs> his quote. I understand. Yeah, because he didn't think that was a good thing. He 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 believed that we had killed God and that uh, that that would be the end of civilization. But anyway, uh, okay. Uh, Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power. There will be a law against the Sabbath of God's creation. Then it is that God will do his strange work in the earth. 
Um, and then from 5T, 7 and 12, when our nation shall abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, Protestantism will, in this act, join hands with popery. How powerful will the papacy eventually become here in America? Protestants are opening the door for the papacy to regain in Protestant America the supremacy which she has lost in the old world. Now, of course, there isn't, there is very, there are very few Americans who would be concerned about the papacy and the Catholic Church controlling the United States. But in Ellen White's day, what she is saying here seems absolutely absurd, right? To Americans, the idea that the Catholic Church could gain favor in America. The Catholic Church was vilified in the United States, you know, 150 years ago. Correct? Right. But it's also, it's also, but now, but now you got, you know, the, you got people in power who's Catholic and all this other. So it's, it's, yeah. The statement is true. I mean, it comes from past. Yeah. Yeah. Who will lead the people as, quite a bit of, yeah. There was quite a bit of excitement when JFK, John F. Kennedy, was elected. You know, he was Catholic, and people were concerned yeah. about that. Yeah, exactly. But, but now, but now, I mean, I I work with some people, or uh, and particularly, I remember talking with one fellow. He, he just loved the Pope, but he had nothing to do with the Bible or being a Christian at all. He just loved the Pope. He thought he was a wonderful person. And when he came to Edmonton back in the, anyways. 80s. Yeah, yeah. And there were streams of people walking like, I don't know, it must have took him an hour to walk out to N- N- Nemeo, Nanaimo, Nemeo Airport. Nemeo. Anyway, the Air, yeah, Nemeo Air, Air Force Base out there. Just thick crowds walking out to see the man. And they mm-hmm. weren't even Catholic. You know, the whole world is, began to wander after the beast. Yep. Okay. Who will lead the people as they unite to oppose the followers of God? As we approach the last crisis, it is a vital moment that harmony and unity exist among the Lord's instrumentalities. The world is filled with storm and war and variance. Yet under one head, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God in the person of his witnesses. This union is cemented by the great apostate. And in reality, who stands behind the Pope? There's one pointed out in prophecy as the man of sin. He is the representative of Satan. Here is Satan's right-hand man, ready to carry on the work that Satan commenced in heaven, that of trying to amend the law of God. And the Christian world has sanctioned his efforts by adopting this child of the papacy, the Sunday institution. What should we be doing now in order to successfully meet Christendom's combined opposition? The world is against us. The popular churches are against us. The law of the land will soon be against us. If there was ever a time when the people of God should press together, it is now. Now, going back to our study from last night, dealing with the evangelical conferences, what was what is the church's solution been? since the death of Ellen White um, to address the world and the popular churches being against us. Has their solution been to press together? Yeah, it's been to, it's been to, um, to, to, um, oh man, I hit it on the tip of my tongue. Make (laughs) make concessions? Well, yeah, that, but they also making, um, but they unite them on points of truth as well. Yeah, so we're involved in the ec- ecumenical movement as much yeah. as, as the other Protestant churches are, right? So so we see this progression. We saw the 1990 Bible Conference. That's where they're going to begin leading towards the idea of getting accreditation for our universities, to have our ministers get degrees and in other institutions, so that we can have accredited institutions, right? We see the evangelical conferences of the 1950s, where they believe that by 
watering down our doctrines, we can then have an influence with the evangelicals. We see in 2001, September of 2001, uh, the church adopting spiritual formation for our ministers. Right. So the church has continually uh, gone opposite this council. Okay, so that's the end of that section. OK, let's let's keep going here. Um, <clears throat> so part three, the National Sunday. What does the Bible say about the homage which Protestant in America will pay to the Roman Catholic power? So we know that that's Revelation 13, verse 11 to 17. That's going to be the two horn power. I don't know if we need to read those verses, but the Protestant America will make an image to the beast. So when will this prophecy be fulfilled? The prophecy of Revelation 13 declares that the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns shall cause the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the papacy. There, symbolized by the beast, like unto a leopard, this prophecy will be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance, which Rome claims as the special acknowledgement of her supremacy. The enforcement of Sunday keeping on the part of Protestant churches is an enforcement of the worship of the papacy. Where will the pressure for Sunday legislation come from? The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe persuade or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. To secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for a Sunday law. Legislators will yield to a demand for Sunday laws. So where does this uh, pressure come from? The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands, etc. Right? If the people can be led to favor a Sunday law, then the clergy intend to exert their united influence to obtain religious amendment to the Constitution and compel the nation to keep Sunday. So one is Ellen White says there's going to be a religious amendment to the Constitution. What does that mean? Amendment. Well, that amendment. The Constitution to compel the nation to keep Sunday. That means all this, every state in the United in the United States will have to approve it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how a constitutional convention occurs. I, I would think that everyone has to agree. It has to be unanimous. Yeah, I reckon it would be. It would have to be, wouldn't it? Yeah, I would think so. That means the Democrats and Republicans would have to have to agree to it. All right. Well, I know, in the, I know yeah. in the past one of the great concerns of having a constitutional or whatever it is, a meeting to amend the Constitution. Once they open that door, other amendments can be brought forth, and so they're they're very careful about doing that. But that's one of the doors that can open. Yeah, so I, th I think it's called a constitutional convention, but uh, I could be wrong. Just trying to see here. Okay, well, yeah, it's a constitutional convention. Uh, that would have to happen. You know, I was just going on by what Bible does says all great and small, you know, would have to, it, they would have to come under that authority, right? Yeah. So, so it, to me, to me, it's no difference between a Republican and a Democrat. They both going to have to, both have, have to come under that authority. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be Republicans against Democrats. That they're they're going to be united in order to pass the Sunday law. Yeah, big well, especially since it's a constant. It's going to be a constitutional amendment, according to the statement from December twenty fourth, eighteen eighty nine. Yeah. Um, do these Sunday law advocates realize what they are doing? There are many, even those engaged in this movement for Sunday enforcement, who are blinded to the results which will follow this action. They do not see that they are striking directly against religious liberty. There are many 
who have never understood the claims of the Bible Sabbath and the false foundation upon which the Sunday institution rests. They are working in blindness. They do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that have made them free, a free independent nation, and through legislation, legislation brings in the, into the Constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusion, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of the Dark Ages. That's uh, so another review on the Herald Extra, December 11th, 1888. There is a satanic force propelling the Sunday movement, but it is concealed. Even the men who are engaged in the work are themselves blinded to the results which will follow their movement. Um, who is actually the chief mastermind of Sunday legislation? Not a move has been made in exalting the idle Sabbath, in bringing around Sunday observance through legislation. But Satan has been behind it and has been the chief worker. Uh, when the legislature frames laws which exalt the first day of the week and put it in the place of the seventh day, the device of Satan will be perfected. The false Sabbath is to be enforced by an oppressive law. Satan and his angels are wide awake and intensely active, working with energy and perseverance through human instrumentalities to bring about his purpose of obliterating from the minds of men the knowledge of God. Upon whom does a Sunday law cast contempt? A more decided effort will be made to exalt the false Sabbath and to cast contempt upon God himself by supplanting the day he is blessed and sanctified. This false Sabbath is to be enforced by an oppressive law. Are we to expect Sunday laws in certain states only, or will the United States Congress take legislative action? Our land is in jeopardy. The time is drawing on when its legislators shall so abjure the principles of Protestantism as to give countenance to Roman apostasy, the people for whom God is so marvelously wrought, strengthening them to throw off the galling yoke of popery, will by a national act give vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome and thus arouse the tyranny, which only waits for a touch to start again into cruelty and despotism. We see that efforts are being made to restrict our religious liberties. The Sunday question is now assuming a large, large proportions. An amendment to our constitution is being urged in Congress. And when it is obtained, oppression must follow. And, and she was saying his back then, so they was doing that back then, right? Yeah, yeah. They're assuming... Sorry, I, I, I just checked the chat there. I posted what it would require to have a uh, amendment amendment to the constitution it doesn't have to be unanimous okay so is it two-thirds i think that's how it reads two -thirds. just read it, read okay, it an amendment may, may be proposed by a two-thirds vote of both houses of congress or if two-thirds of the states request one by a convention called for that purpose the, the amendment must be ratified by three-fourths of the state's legislatures or three-fourths of conventions called in each state for ratification. Hmm. Not really sure what that means exactly. Uh, yes, but it's going to be unanimous, but, but yeah. it, it's going to come from the grassroots up. There's going to be a call for it. Okay. Anyway, we're... So when we look at this, um, this whole issue of the Sunday law, you know, and we've talked about this many times, it has to be a religious Sunday law. It, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine it in the world that we have today that you could just like have a Sunday law tomorrow. You, you couldn't. There's, there's nothing uniting all of these forces. And, and so we say, well, is there going to be a disaster? What's going to happen that's going to call for the Sunday law? Now, we know the Sunday law is progressive. So when we get to the Sunday law, originally when Ellen White writes of the Sunday law, prior to her great controversy visions, when she's first writing about a Sunday law, she's talking about a Sunday law during the time of Jacob's trouble, after the close of probation. Later on, she, she has visions regarding this progression of the Sunday law 
uh, first in the United States and then in the rest of the world. So, so that understanding of the Sunday law, its progressive nature, uh, is something that we, we generally don't understand. We just talk about the Sunday law, but there's more than one Sunday law. The one with the death decree is, um, you know, of course, after the close of probation. Exactly how those Sunday laws unfold, I'm not sure that I clearly understand. I just know that the United States begins, it moves through the rest of the world. There's a loud cry at that time. Probation will close when everybody is aware of those issues. And then the seven last plagues followed. So I'm sure we'll read a lot more statements on this as we go through this, this booklet. Any final comments before we close with prayer? I'd like to, <clears throat> like to, uh, welcome my friend Sean who joined the study with us today and asked to mention us in prayer. Okay. So mention Sean in prayer or all of you guys? Uh, specifically Sean and I were, we've been listening in so that we can understand and, and be blessed by the study and recover, recover. Okay. okay. Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, the blessings of spiritual rest that we can have in Christ as we seek every day uh, to know you through your word and through the work of your Holy Spirit. We just ask that this Sabbath can continue to be a blessing. I pray for Sean and Kelly as they seek to recover. We know, Lord, that all of us face a battle. And without you, we are powerless. And so we ask for your angels' care. We ask for your Holy Spirit's work upon our heart and your power in our lives. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust in you for all righteousness and all things. Bless each person studying these things, seeking for truth. May you guide and direct them. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.